I would invite your attention to the Word of God today to Luke chapter number 15. Luke chapter 15. Sometimes as a pastor, when you're getting ready to preach and you're wondering what to preach, uh, you tend to always look for new stories or new scripture verses. There are only so many principles or spiritual truths, uh, foundational truths, and so there are lots of ways to illustrate them. And so sometimes we tend to, to skip over the most common commonly known stories, stories from Sunday school or that uh, other people preach on. And uh, this might be one of those passages, but I'm going to preach on it today. And uh, I really had to struggle with giving you a title for it. Um, I, I, I suppose one of the best ways for me to do it to begin with would be, how well do you know God? How well do you know God? Um, the other title I thought about was Three Thrilling Truths About God. Three Thrilling Truths About God in relationship to you, in relationship to me. So I'm going to begin here in chapter 15. I did want to make a couple of quick notes. Uh, one is that um, we would like to ask mom and dad if you'd help us with this and we'll try to, to, to get it to become habitual knowledge. But because we only have the one washroom back in the back of the auditorium in the um, lobby, uh, we would ask that, uh, that those who are 20 years old or younger uh, always go downstairs to use the washroom. Their ability to navigate stairs is much better than those who are seniors. And a lot of times we'll have children that will be in there and the seniors are standing outside waiting and that's not needful. So I'm going to ask you to help us with that. If you would, please. Also, uh, we're looking for next Sunday, Lord willing, the plan is to baptize. We have two uh, people that are ready to follow the Lord in believers' baptism. We're excited about that. If you have been uh, considering baptism and are, are uh, waiting uh, for the right moment, this would be a good time for you to step up as well. So we'll look forward to that next Sunday. And then next Monday, I have the privilege of leaving and going to Kenya, Africa, and then also to South Sudan. A few weeks ago, probably several weeks ago, I asked you if you would consider, especially the young people, putting together some cards or writing a letter or a note or something that you would send with me to the children of South Sudan, talking to them about Canada and what life's like here and serving the Lord and how happy you are that they, are, that they have a church and that they're growing in the Lord. Something to be an encouragement. And as you heard this morning, <laughs> there, were, there were over a thousand that came to Bible school they may have two or three hundred in Sunday school, so obviously I know that I'm not going to get two or three hundred letters, so I can't get them all individually, but I will. I noted there were some in the back today uh, that were brought in, and I will, if you'll write something, read it to them, share it with them during the course of my stay there, and I think that might be an encouragement to them to know if somebody thinks about them, took time to write something or draw a picture or whatever, so that would be uh, an opportunity for you. All right, Luke chapter number 15, let's begin in verse number 1. The Bible says, Then drew near unto him, that is Jesus, all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. A publican was a, basically was a tax collector, somebody who was normally a Jewish person, but they had uh, taken an employee of the Roman government uh, and were collecting taxes and not only did they have a certain amount they had to collect, but they also could get more than they should. Zacchaeus was one like that and would take advantage of their position. So they were considered sinners, and they were not welcome uh, by the average, everyday, religious person. So drawing near to Jesus are all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured. The Pharisees and the scribes were people who were religious. So what you might say is we have a non-religious crowd and a religious crowd. The Pharisee was a, was a person who was very concerned about keeping the Old Testament laws and being clean and being holy and, and keeping the letter of the law. Now, Jesus exposed them. It was all on the outside with them, not in the heart. And uh, he rebuked them several times, but the scribe was the person who copied the law. So both the Pharisees and the scribes knew the law well. And because they knew the law well, and what the Bible said that you, thou shalt do and thou shalt not do, they looked at the publican and the sinner and said, hmm, we don't want anything to do with you. 
We're not going to spend time with you. Uh, you, are, uh, you are not worth our effort. And when they saw Jesus surrounded by these publicans and sinners, they murmured saying, this man, Jesus, receiveth sinners and eateth with them. So we have two people, one who welcomes sinners, one who doesn't welcome sinners. Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees. And Jesus spoke this parable unto them saying. So now, I want you to, to realize that you and I know what we know about God based on, I will say, one of three sources. One of three things has given rise to what you believe and act upon in reference to God. Number one, of course, would be God's revelation. The Bible is the revelation of God. God says, here's who I am. Here's, here's why I am. Here's what my purpose is. Here's who you are and why you are and what I want to do with you. So we can get it, our knowledge of God, from the revelation that God gives of himself. And it would seem to me that's the best place to get it, right? Wouldn't you rather be the one representing you to somebody else who doesn't know you to tell them the truth about who you are rather than somebody who really doesn't know you as just making some assumptions or guesses? So you either know about God through his revelation or number two, you know about him because of the religious circle you grew up in and some people who were religious in their behavior and, and practices taught you certain things about God. And matter of fact, their religious ceremonies and practices are because they understand something or believe something about God. Are you with me? Or the third thing is, you didn't get it from a religious crowd. You didn't get it from a revelation. You got it from your own heart, mind, and imagination. It's what makes sense to you. It's what feels good to you. And a lot of people treat God, whoever he may be, from that aspect. I, I, it doesn't make sense to me. It's not logical. I can't see it. I, I can't be sure uh, that there's a God. And so if there is a God and they do believe in God, they will, they will believe, well, he has to be this way. And probably because that's the way I am, I made an image of God. So if I feel this way, then God must feel that way. And they come to that reason. So here's a group of men who understood God from a religious standpoint and when they react to Jesus, time spent with the publican and, and uh, scribe, he says, guys, let me tell you a story. Now, the Bible says he spake this parable unto them. And in the, in the rest of this chapter, he's going to tell three simple stories. I'm not going to belabor every verse, but I want you to hear these three stories. And I want to suggest to you three tremendous, thrilling truths about God that they didn't get, and Jesus wanted them to get. So the first story he tells is about a shepherd and sheep. We'll start in verse 4. What man of you? So he's looking at those who are finding fault with him. said, look, if, if, if any one of you had a hundred sheep, if he lost one of his sheep, which one of you does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, and call, he calleth together his friends and his neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So he tells them a little story that they can relate to. And, and uh, I don't know whether you and I would relate to it, because we live in a different world now, but, but sheep were property, they were very important. And uh, the shepherd would not want to lose anyone, so he would leave the 90 and 9, and he would expend whatever time, energy, and attention needed to, to find the one. When he found it, his heart would be filled with joy. And so happy would he be that he'd call his good friends together and say, celebrate with me. Let's rejoice together, for this my sheep which was lost is, has been found. And then he said to those guys, after telling that story, I'm telling you, I say unto you, that likewise, just like that, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. 
He wants them to understand what the atmosphere of heaven is like. And by the way, he's qualified to tell them because he came down from heaven. And they're wanting to go to heaven. And they're thinking that heaven is all about this. And this is how you get there. And Jesus said, you misunderstand. Let me tell you how it is in heaven. In heaven, there is joy, not over the myriad number of people who have come to faith in Christ, have now uh, died physically, and have now entered into heaven, and now surround the throne. The joy of heaven is not rejoicing in those. It's rejoicing. The joy is rekindled every time one more lost sheep is found. So lesson number one, terrific truth number one, is that you are important to God. You are important to God. Now you can hear me say that, and you can say, I agree with that. Do you live that? Is your life every day dominated by, ruled by, fueled by the truth that you individually are important to God? Ninety and nine he loves them all. They're in the fold. They belong to him. But if there's one who isn't there, he's going to go after them at every cost until he finds them. And he will rejoice. Have you ever felt in your life like I felt at times? Have you ever felt like you are somewhat insignificant? Like maybe you really didn't matter? You don't count? No one really seems to care? No one notices? Have you ever expended energy and effort trying hard to fit in? Trying hard to get noticed? Trying hard to matter to somebody? I think all around us, multitudes of people feel that way and do that every day. I've been there. Have you ever, have you ever longed to be valuable to be precious, to be meaningful in someone's eyes. Maybe it's a specific person, or maybe it's just anyone's eyes. Have you ever wanted somebody to really just care about you? Well, you don't need to feel that way any longer because you are important to Him. You matter to Him. You are significant to Him. You are precious to Him. If you were the only one lost he would still leave the, he the glories of heaven and he would come. And Jesus said, you guys don't understand why I'm here. I'm not here to celebrate your religion and your faith. I'm here to seek those who don't know the truth and who need to know the truth. They're lost and they need somebody to find them. That's what it's all about. You are important to God. You matter to God. From Genesis to Revelation, every story you read screams, God loves you. You are important to God. Here's Hagar out in the wilderness all by herself, feeling uh, sorry for herself, thinking life is over. And out of nowhere, she hears a voice. Hagar, what aileth thee? You know who it was? It was God. When nobody else knew where she was and probably cared where she was, he did. He knew where she was and he testified, I know exactly where you are, you matter to me. And he gave her instruction and said, here's what I'm going to do for you. Here's what I want you to do and here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm telling you all through the Bible, here's this young tax collector, this short guy named Zacchaeus. And uh, he's not well-loved and not well-liked so far as we can uh, uh, see from Scripture. He's up in a tree because he wants to see Jesus. It doesn't matter to anybody. He's not important to anybody. Nobody treasures him or values him. But Jesus stops, looks up in the tree, and says his name. Come down, I'm going to your house today. I am going to dwell or visit you in your home today. You matter to me. Oh, I wish you would believe that. I wish instead of crying yourself to sleep at night because somebody has made you feel insignificant or nobody seems to care or nobody notices, that you'd go to bed at night with a smile on your face saying, God, 
I can't believe that you, the God of the universe who upholds everything by the word of his power, care about me. You love me. You sought me until you found me, and I am important to you. He is never going to be more satisfied. He's never going to be satisfied until he has 100% of those that the Father has given him. God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He, you matter so much to him, he knows how many hairs you have on your head. And it changes every day. I don't know if we're growing more hairs every day, but I know we're losing them. At least I do. I go into the shower, take a shower, get out of the shower, and I look at the floor of the shower. Somebody lost some hair in here. God's not confused. He hasn't lost track. He knows exactly how many hairs I have. And he said, Jesus said, God knows when a sparrow falls. Not one of them falls to the ground without your father knowing and caring. And you are of so much more value than any sparrow. I know I'm probably preaching to the choir for most of you, but I want you to go out of this room today knowing that you matter to God. You don't matter to the Pharisee. You may not matter to the scribe. You may not matter to your neighbor. You may not even matter to some of your family members, but you matter to God. And you're in danger of thinking that's not true because you don't matter to somebody else. Because you feel like you don't matter to the preacher, or you don't matter to the Sunday school teacher, or you don't matter to your wife, or to your husband, or to your children. And you may then judge that, but that is not the true judgment of God. God loves you. You matter to Him. So after Jesus told him that story, he told him a second story. He says, here's this woman, uh, starting in verse number uh, 8. She has 10 pieces of silver. If she loses one piece, what woman doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, Jesus said, if you can imagine that scenario, I want you to know that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Lesson number two is not only are you important to God, you are valuable to God. Valuable to God. Silver, for this woman, is the currency by which she operates in the world. Silver is the way she buys her groceries. Silver is the way she pays the rent. Silver is the way she gets things done. She depends on silver. It's the currency that enables her to accomplish something. And maybe, maybe in our day we're so affluent in North America that losing one coin or losing one silver coin or losing a dollar or losing a $10 bill, even a $100 bill may concern us, but it wouldn't cause us to drop everything and put all that effort into finding it. But in that day it did. And the picture clearly understood means that that piece of silver was valuable to her, whether it was valuable to anybody else or not. Are you with me? Do you not understand that the only currency God uses to accomplish anything in this world? He can speak the world into existence. He can make whatever he wants. He owns the silver and the gold. Everything is his. The currency that God has that he uses, the only way that he gets anything accomplished in this world, and it's by his wise design, is through people. He calls people, he chooses people, he blesses people, he sends people, and he uses them as currency. And so there may be many that are saved, but if there's one person who is safe in the house, but they're not useful, they're lost, they've gone out of circulation, they're not, they're not out there where, where the Father can use them to accomplish his purpose, he's going to come after you and stay after you because you're valuable to him. If I had a $100 bill here today in my hand, and I don't, I don't have one in my pocket, wish I'd have got one. But anyway, suppose I had a $100 bill in my hand and I said, how many of you in this room would, would take this if I honestly offered it to you just as a free gift? How many of you would like to have this $100 bill? 
I'm suspecting that everybody would. I don't know who wouldn't, except the person who likes to be contrary and mess up the preacher's illustration. <laughs> but I offer you $100. Why? Because of what it is or because of what you can do with it, what you can accomplish with it? Suppose I took that $100 bill and then I wadded it up, crumpled it up and rolled it into a ball and then held it up and said, all right, how many of you would like to have this $100 bill? I'm willing to give it to you. How many would like to take it? Would your opinion change? Would you all of a sudden not want the $100 bill? You likely would still take it. What if I sneezed on it? Or rolled it up, stuck it under my arm and held it for a while. Offered it to you again. Would you still take it? If you would... Tell me why you would. Because its value doesn't change by what it's been through or what's happened to it. What if I took it, unfolded it, ripped it in half, and then offered you two halves of the same bill? Would you take it? You should. Because you can tape it and take it back to the bank, and it will still be the same value as it was before. You need to understand something. You are valuable to God. We listen to the devil's lies who said, God can't use you. Your life is over. Look what you've done. Look where you've been. Look what kind of conditions you're in. Look how you've been treated. That matters nothing. Your value is with what God can do when he has you in his hands. You are valuable to God. Your life counts. God can use you as much as he can use me or as much as he can use anyone else. Your value is not determined by the condition in which you are found or by what you have gone through, but by what God can do through you when he finds you. He can put you back into circulation and use you in the same way that he would have done before whatever it was that happened, happened to you. You're important to God. You are valuable to God. And would you notice that in both of these stories, the joy is over one that's been found more than those who need no repentance. What does the word repentance mean? The word repentance means to be returned or restored or recovered. So when the sheep is recovered and restored to the fold, that means the, the direction it was heading is no longer the direction in which it's heading. It's been found. It's now back home, and it's now in a new surrounding and listening to and following the voice of the shepherd. God is interested in repentance. These men who knew the law, who knew the scripture, were not sorry about their sin. There was no change in them. They didn't feel there was any need for them to change. And there is a lost person out there, who a sheep or a coin, who cannot be useful or who cannot be safe because they've lost their connection to their creator. God wants that situation to change. And joy is over repentance. There's some people today who say repentance is not necessary. It's an old-fashioned doctrine. It's needless. It's faith that we're saved in. But the Bible says, except you repent. Matter of fact, it was Jesus who said it. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You'll all be lost. Well, let me go to lesson three. The third thrilling truth is told in, verse, uh, in the next uh, verse and uh, down through uh, chapter. So we begin in verse number 11. It goes all the way down uh, to verse number 32. It's a story of a man who has two sons. The youngest of those two sons decides one day he, wants, he doesn't want to stay at home anymore. He wants to leave home. So he asks his dad if he could have his inheritance early. His dad agrees. He gives him his inheritance. The Bible says that he goes out into a far country, goes a long ways away from home, and he wasted his substance in riotous living. In other words, he lived it up. He just lived in pleasure and, and did what he wanted, got what he wanted, experienced what he wanted. But the Bible says there came a point where he spent all. So everything that he'd been given is now gone. And at that moment, a famine arises in the land. And he begins to be in want. He has no means to meet the emergency of the famine 
And so he's hungry, and in his hunger and his desperation, he joins himself to a, a, a man uh, and has a job feeding the pigs or feeding the swine, as the Bible puts it in verse 15. And in verse 16, his situation is such that he would have fain, he fain would have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave to him. But the next sentence is important. This is repentance. He came to himself. And he said, this is ridiculous. How many servants, not sons, just servants that are paid to serve and work in my father's house eat so much better than I? So I know what I'm going to do. He's a smart fella. He said, I'm going to go home. I'm going to confess to my dad that I've sinned against him. And I'm going to ask him if he'll just let me become a servant. I'm not expecting to be a son anymore. I'm just ready to be a servant so that I can eat three square meals a day, so that I can have food and clothing and shelter. I'm ready to be a servant. By the way, that's humility. Pride is how he left. Humility is the way he's going to return. So he gets up. He leaves the, the employee of the man who feed, has him feeding swine, and he heads back home. And you know the story, don't you? If you don't, I'm happy to tell you. The father sees him coming. Look at the text. Look at the scripture. The father, while he was a ways away. Look at verse 20. He arose and came to his father, but while he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He doesn't wait for him to come home. He doesn't wait for him to to give the speech that he's carefully rehearsed over and over again as he walked down the road. He doesn't come. He doesn't sit on the porch, get out his pen, and so here he comes. Here he comes, I'll tell you. All right, before he gets here, let me, let me uh, number one, you must make your bed every day. Number two, you want to come back in this house? You must go work uh, for me in the field from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Number four, he doesn't sit down and make a list of rules and draw up a contract that he's asked ask his son to sign. He sees him coming. What I want you to know and what Jesus wanted them to know, that the father loves his son. So here's truth number three. God's love is unconditional. God's love is unconditional. He runs and falls on his neck and kisses him and welcomes him and then puts together a big celebration. He treats him uh, unconditional love. He doesn't even let him get his speech out. Somebody pointed out one time, and I, I've never forgotten it, that this is the only record in the Bible, unless you can find it somewhere else, the only record in the Bible where a picture of God pictures God in a hurry. God's never in a hurry. We're, we're told to wait upon God, to be patient and to wait upon the Lord and to trust in the Lord. But he is in a hurry. The Father who represents God the Father runs to meet the prodigal and welcomes him without any conditions, without any kind of a contract, without any expectation I tell you, if you and I lived in the light of this truth, we would be so happy. We would be so free. I'm not saying to you that, that you would live in sin, for you wouldn't. If you understand the unconditional love of the Father, you respond to the unconditional love of the Father with love in return. The other son worked hard, stayed home, was faithful, picked up the slack. He's bitter against the love of the father expressed to his brother. And the father says to him, wait, son, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. My love for him is not greater than yours. The truth is my love is the same for both. My love is unconditional. What a wonderful God we serve. His love is unconditional. You don't have to earn it. He knows where you've been, and he knows why you went, and he knows what's been going on while you're gone, and he waits for you to make a move back, and when you, in sincerity, make a decision in your heart, I'm going to go home to the Father, he runs to meet you and will welcome you and love you. This is the God I serve. This is the God they did not know. 
They had read about the God of the law, the God of Mount Sinai, but they missed all the other things in the Old Testament law which pictured the mercy and long-suffering and forgiveness and grace of an unconditionally loving God. They allowed teachers to teach them what God was like. They allowed their own mind to teach them what God was like. Jesus said, I've been there. Let me tell you what God is like. Let me tell you why I welcome sinners. Let me tell you why they're my friends, because they're God's friends. They're lost, and they're important to him, and they're valuable to him, and he loves them unconditionally. So should you, and so should I. Oh, I hope you delight in that, God. I, I was thinking this morning about a song that I hear, and I, I couldn't remember all the words. Well, I could remember these words. He loves me like I was his only child. What a great song. Nobody's any better than you, and you're no better than anybody. You are as valuable and as important to God, and his love for you is unconditional. Love him, embrace him, rejoice in him. And let's determine we're going to be like Jesus. Let's stay close to him, first of all, and let's not get lost. Let's not wander off and get lost from his presence and his fellowship. And let's not drop out of circulation and stop being useful to God. While, though, you have the opportunity, stay close to him and trust him. But also, would you reflect him? When Jesus restored Peter, he said, Peter, do you love me? And he said, you know I love you, Lord. And he said, then feed my sheep. If you love me, love me by loving others. And that's what he's teaching the Pharisees and the scribes. You don't know God. Sinners are important to God. Sinners are valuable to God. And God's love is unconditional. That's the God we know. And that's the God we love. And that's the God we serve. I hope you're encouraged by those truths. I hope you'll live by those truths, embrace those truths, believe those truths, and then go tell the Pharisees and the scribes who Jesus is, who God is, how God is, how he feels. Share it with them. That's what Jesus did. They didn't understand, so he told them. And I don't know how many of them believed, but at least they, were, they received the witness of the one who knew the very heart of God. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor. And all that come to me, I will in no wise cast out. Not a one of you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, bless the preaching of your word to the heart of the hearers. Oh, Father, forgive us for being so robotic, so formal, so unconcerned, so, lack, uh, so impassionate, about the truth of Scripture, the grace that is revealed to us from the heart of our Father, from your heart for, for us as sinners. I pray that from this day forward, everyone on the sound of my voice would believe and act and live by these truths, that they are important to you, valuable to you for service and you love them and always will always have and always will love them unconditionally though you'll rejoice with others when they return home you'll still love them anyway when they're away father please help us and help us to reflect this kind of love this kind of understanding of god to our community who are confused who don't know the truth about God, about you. Father, dismiss us with your blessing today. Help us to act upon these truths in a way that pleases you in Jesus' name. Amen.